For the first problem, we will solve the case of a triangular truss. In this truss, the height of the triangle is 40 feet. The length of the base is also 40 feet, with the force applied at the apex of minus 200 pounds, indicating that it is in the down direction, occurring at 20 feet from one corner of the triangle. It is also worth noting that we have a pin occurring at point C. This pin constrains the truss, preventing it from moving in either the vertical direction or the horizontal direction. At the bottom corner underneath the A joint, we have a set of rollers. These rollers constrain the movement of the truss vertically, but do not constrain it horizontally. In many practical problems, this combination is used to allow the expansion of the truss without forcing breakage that would occur if we had, for instance, two pins occurring here. In solving step one of our problem, we will begin to determine the dimensions of the various parts of our triangular truss. To begin with, we will find the, the angle alpha. This angle is most easily determined by noting that the height of the triangle is 40 feet and the base of the triangle is 20 feet. The tangent of the angle alpha is then 40 feet divided by 20 feet, or 2. If we then determine the angle alpha, we find it to be 63.4 degrees. We can also find the length of the hypotenuse. This is the length of the two sides of the triangle. In this case, the sine of the angle alpha is equal to the vertical height of 40 feet divided by the length of the hypotenuse. Since we already have determined that the angle of alpha is 63.4 degrees, we can substitute that in. We then find that the length of the hypotenuse is equal to 40 feet divided by the sine of 63.4 degrees for a length of the hypotenuse of 44.72 feet. The next step is to find the angle beta at the top of our truss. Since we know that the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees, we can start to substitute in. So 180 degrees minus the angle alpha, 63.4 degrees, minus the 90 degree angle that is occurring at the base of this triangle is equal to one-half of the total angle beta. Thus, beta is equal to 53.2 degrees. To find the angle gamma, we note that the triangle is isosceles. We can use symmetry to determine that the angle alpha is equal to the angle gamma. Thus, the angle gamma is equal to 63.4 degrees. We have now completely dimensioned and determined the angles for our truss. The next step, step two, is to create the free body diagram. This is done by taking all of the dimensions of the truss, retaining those, all of the lengths of the different sides of the truss, noting that we have applied a load of 200 pounds in the down direction. As we noted earlier, at the point A, the rollers constrain the movement of our truss in the vertical direction, but not in the horizontal direction. Similarly, the pin here at point C constrains the movement of the truss in both the X and the Y dimensions. In this way, we have converted our truss diagram into a free body diagram. 
Note that there are multiple unknowns in this diagram. In step three, we need to find the reaction forces applied to our truss. This is most easily performed by starting at the pin joint. Because these two forces here and here occur through the pin joint, they have no impact on the moment around that point, and we are left with one unknown. Also noting, once again, that the moment is equal to force times distance, and that the sum of the moments is equal to zero. To determine the force of the load applied at point B, we extend the line of that force down through the truss until it is perpendicular to a line drawn from that line to the point about which the moment is taken. Since we already know that that distance is 20 feet, and we know that the force in the down direction is 200 pounds, we can multiply the 200 pounds times the length of 20 feet. Note that the units of this moment are foot-pounds. Next, isolating the force RAY, we find that it is equal to 4,000, or the 200 pounds occurring at 20 feet, divided by the length that force RAY is from point C. This gives us a value for force RAY of positive 100 pounds, or we see 100 pounds in the up direction. The next step is to find the forces in the y direction occurring at point C. Recall that the sum of the forces in the y direction must also be equal to zero. Thus, the sum of the reactive force, RAY, the force LBY, the load, plus the force RCY must be equal to zero. If we now substitute in the known values for these three forces, we find that 100 pounds minus 200 pounds plus the force RCY is equal to zero. We can now isolate the force RCY to determine it to be 100 pounds. Next, we need to find the reactive force applied at point C in the x direction. If you will recall, the sum of all the forces in the x direction must equal zero. So, if we add the reactive force at point A in the direction with the load force applied at point B in the x direction to the reactive force at point C in the x direction, they must equal zero. If we substitute in the known values for the forces, the force at point A is zero, the force at point B is zero, therefore the force occurring at point C in the x direction must also be zero.